Hello and welcome to all our viewers who are uh, tuning in online. On behalf of the John and Pat Hume Foundation, my name is Dawn Purvis and I'd like to welcome you to our first discussion event. Um, and today we have uh, Dimpna McGlade who's going to talk about uh, the unfinished business of reconciliation. Dimpna is a proud North Belfast woman. Her parents, Frank and Rebecca, were among the founder members of the Civil Rights Campaign. So it was natural for her to become involved in social justice issues. She has worked in community development, community relations since the early 1980s and is currently working and has been to influence government since 2002. So our format today is that Dimpna will, will talk to that title, The Unfinished Business of Reconciliation. And then we have two responders. We have Eileen Weir. Eileen is a well-respected community development practitioner with over 30 years extensive experience in building good relations, community capacity and supporting community cohesion and strategic community development. Eileen, as many of you will know, has been working for the Shankill Women's Centre for quite some time and she's the Greater North Belfast Women's Network Coordinator. And she's also worked with extensively with community organisations across North and West Belfast and is working towards creating a West Belfast Women's Network. Something you might know about Eileen is that she's received two prestigious awards. Uh, the first presented by the Community Relations Council for Exceptional Achievement Award and the second was the McCluskey Civil Rights Award for her role in human rights, civil rights and peace building activities. Our second responder today is Professor Duncan Morrow. Duncan is a lecturer in politics at Ulster University where he has published in the fields of conflict resolution, Northern Ireland politics and the relationship between religion and politics. He is currently the Director of Community Engagement at Ulster University, developing relationships with groups and organisations across the community. On behalf of the John and Pat Hume Foundation, I'd like to thank the Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Reconciliation Fund for kindly supporting our event today. Dimpna. Thanks, Don. Um, the unfinished business of reconciliation, a big topic, but one whenever I look back over uh, research findings and over the work I'd been doing and other groups I've been involved in, hasn't changed an awful lot, so you'll maybe find I'm repeating things that you already know. Um, I once asked a community relations worker how she felt about the peace process and she said, Dimpna, it's like having one foot nailed to the floor and just moving round and round in circles. That conversation took place uh, in 2007 and when it was storming, it was just about ret to return after a five year suspension. And at that time, there was a huge amount of excellent work going on on the ground within and between communities, but peace building was hampered by unsustainable political leadership weak policies and delivery strategies, the lack of resources and support, avoidance and denial of key issues, with no societal approach to a shared future. And I wondered how she would feel about the current situation. Would it feel like she had both feet nailed to the floor? We've just had a return to Stormont after a three year hiatus of power sharing in January of this year. Unfortunately, I've come to the conclusion that after 22 years since the Good Friday Agreement, we have to accept that our two biggest parties, I call them the ruling parties, operate from opposing and competing and uncompromising agendas. I believe this is the main reason for our undynamic peace process on the ground for the past 22 years. John Hume once said, when people are divided, the only solution is agreement. The executive is obsessed with agreement but not necessarily their full implementation. Since the Good Friday Agreement, we have had the following, and forgive me if I ever overlooked any of the many. The St Andrews Agreement in 2007, the Hillsborough Agreement 2010, Stormont House Agreement 2014, the Fresh Start Implementation Plan 2015, the New Decade, New Approach Deal, January 2020. Running alongside these, we've had a series of community and good relations, research, policies and strategies. The Review of Community Relations Policy by Jeremy Harbinson in 2002. A Shared Future Policy, 2005. The Racial Equality Strategy, 2005 and updated in 2015. 
the Cohesion Sharing and Integration Strategy in 2010 and the current Together Building a United Community Strategy in 2013 and as I say it's current. Apart from tinkering around the edges and creating a lot of new buzzwords and terminologies and trendy new ways to record output, I question the impact of all these policies in the worst affected areas by the conflict. Each new government policy strategy designed to build a peace, the peace tends to water down terminology and aspirations so much so that they lean more towards community and economic development rather than peace and reconciliation. Therefore, I suggest we move to the next phase of the peace process and produce a peace plan for the current time we are in. No fancy title, and I use the word peace plan deliberately because I think it says what it is. No confusing terminology, but simple and to the point peace and reconciliation speak that people on the street will understand and hopefully buy into and participate in. And when I was researching into uh, the subject, I came across a 1969 newspaper article headline Catholic and Protestant work for peace. It was my mother and a Protestant man called Bobby Armstrong from the neighbouring area of Louisa Street who were trying to hold the peace together in a time when it was just absolute turmoil. The majority of people here are hungry for change. They hope for a better life for future generations and are weary of the constant reminders of our violent and segregated past. They voted with their feet for the Good Friday Agreement with a huge 71% yes in the north, 95% in the south, sending a clear message that people overwhelmingly support a political settlement and peace and reconciliation. The Good Friday Agreement admittedly brought large-scale violence to an end. That was a great achievement in itself. It also led to the transformation of police, policing, another huge accomplishment. It committed the government to, and I quote, strive in every practical way towards reconciliation. This was a golden opportunity to create the conditions for a lasting peace. But this has been hampered by politics of blame and disagreement. Voters are losing interest and confidence in our politicians and it's shown in the 61% turnout in the Westminster election in 2019 compared to the massive 81% turnout for the Good Friday Agreement referendum. But people still want to move from segregation to integration and examples can be found in the 2017 Northern Ireland Life and Times survey which states that 78% respondents stated a preference for living in a mixed neighbourhood and 89% of the respondents said they prefer to work in a mixed workplace. But these voices go unheard. I call them the silent majority. I'm not saying that achieving peace and reconciliation is easy, it's not. The current context we are living in pose additional challenges to the peace process. Brexit has a huge implication for the Northern Ireland peace process, the economy and potential impact on constitutional issues and legal matters, including the European Convention on Human Rights, which the British government are reluctant to formally commit to as part of this withdrawal agreement. Brexit has already opened a huge contentious debate on the return of a hard border which someone once described as the biggest interface barrier in this region. There has also been a disgraceful increase in attacks, harassment against minority ethnic communities since the referendum. Only two days ago, a large group of youths attacked a house of a minority ethnic resident in Allergan. It looked like the, something from a Frankenstein movie. It was just short of the uh, pitchforks and um, burning bushes. Leaving the European Union will cut us off from the financial and moral support it has provided the Northern Ireland peace process since 1995. I very much doubt if the British government will be willing to match the European financial, legislative and moral support in any new arrangements. Then we have the Covid pandemic, which is still unfolding. Sectarianism and racism have already raised their ugly heads in this instance too. How we manage COVID, the Covid virus as an island or a UK region is an issue. And bizarrely, the Northern Ireland Agriculture Minister, Edwin Poots, suggested that the virus was more rife in nationalist areas than unionist areas by a factor of six to one. All these issues make the need for an updated, secure, long-term peace plan all the more urgent. We need a plan that is relevant and fit for purpose for the current times we are in. 
I'd like to touch on some of the peace and reconciliations issues that we have kept, that have kept our feet nailed to the floor. And these are not exhaustive, they're just some. In terms of leadership, the collapse of the executive in 2017 was a blow to public confidence and devolved into institutions with responsibility for peace building. Politicians have a responsibility to the whole of society, not just their electoral base. This is especially true when it comes to peace building, which requires a united political leadership at executive, assembly and local government level. Politicians must become leaders and champions in peace building, working collectively rather than many fiefdoms. A good starting point is the development of this dream updated peace plan that I constantly rattle on about. It should reflect the current context in which peace building is delivered and build on what has been achieved to date. It must include a strategic framework, dedicated resources, a robust way to monitor progress to ensure we keep moving positively forward towards a united multicultural society, and agreement to hear and act upon expert external advice. The executive must deliver on its agreements and not undermine them. I have an example of shared housing, which is part of the, the tea book strategy, where at Felden, Sinn Féin declared that they had a nationalist housing, they had a secured nationalist housing, and then you had Ravenhill where flags went up and the DUP were reluctant and would not address the issue as a main problem and uh, intimidation and harassment. And there are other examples. Broad civic engagement in other vital ingredient, as another vital ingredient to successful peace building. Voluntary and community, group, community groups have the right to give their honest opinion and recommendations to government without fear of losing their funding or being sidelined when it comes to con it runs contrary to political views. In the absence of a civic forum, we do not have an oversight body to monitor progress in peace building, identify blockages and log jams, act as a challenge function, promote ethical leadership and give annual independent updates. Government run that and they run it from a top-down approach. There are many experienced and respected peace builders out there who could fulfil this role and who are not accountable to church, political groups, funders or employers. Perhaps the John and Pat Hume Foundation could explore this idea further. The legacy of the past must also be addressed. The Good Friday Agreement asserted it is essential to acknowledge and address the suffering of the victims of violence as a necessary element of reconciliation. The conflict left many victims and survivors who have suffered loss on poor mental and physical health. A staggering 3,000 out of the 3,636 conflict-related conflict deaths remain unsolved. Survivors continue to battle for pensions, justice, compensation and acknowledgement. These important matters are extremely sensitive, highly controversial and tend to be an ongoing political wrangle as to how to address them. Approaches have been piecemeal and need to be addressed in time-bound, inclusive, well-resourced planning to address all the issues contained in the Fresh Start Implementation Plan. Flags, emblems, bonfires, parades and the Irish language also come under the umbrella of legacy issues and remain outstanding. Until legacy of the past issues are tackled, they will continue to cause disagreement, division and hinder political progress, reconciliation and economic growth. The new decade, new approach deal in January 2020, the parties agreed to reaffirm their commitment to tackling paramilitarism and ending sectarianism. It states that reconcilia reconciliation will be central to the executive's approach with a focus on building a united community. Good to hear, but it's all been said before in some shape or form. Nevertheless, I hope they appreciate the importance and urgency of this commitment when they read the third annual update on progress towards ending paramilitary activity by the Independent Reporting Commission issued this month. It states that paramilitarism remains a clear and present danger in Northern Ireland. We've heard for many years that paramilitary groups were transforming. They have had 22 years to consider this. The question I would like an answer to is what are they transforming into? Research in 2018 by academic Paul Nolan identified that 158 security-related deaths in Northern Ireland since the Good Friday Agreement happened. Paramilitary assaults were on the rise. In 2018, 51 paramilitary assaults were, uh, happened 
and increased to 67 in 2019. And these continue in 2020, even during uh, an international pandemic. The reality in many working class areas is that paramilitary groups are still operating by name and people associated with them are often called upon by the media to speak on the community's behalf. Flags, murals, bonfires and other activities remain as a, re a reminder of who's in charge. Are local people safe to take control in these areas? I don't think so. The silent and often frightened majority living in single identity areas need to have a safe enough environment to have a voice to plan how their area can benefit from the peace process. If people moving away from paramilitary groups want to be involved in the transformation of society, then they must fit in with the legitimate community plans, as many of their colleagues have successfully achieved. Enough time has elapsed, enough education, training and funding given and plenty of consideration to the plight of paramilitary groups. They have a responsibility to disband, discontinue violence and give up control within communities. It's time to move on, boys, and politicians and the police have a responsibility to make this happen. The multicultural society, I have to say that happily people from other cultures and countries want to stay here or come and live here. This is a real sign of progress and peace, as our minority ethnic population was quite small before and during the conflict. It provides an opportunity to build a shared society, to reflect and cherish our, cherish our diverse population, and build a foundation for human rights and equality. We have a discussion across society about how a shared multicultural society would work in relation to flags, bonfires, emblems, festivals, parades, shared housing, integrated education, language, sectarianism and racism. This approach shouldn't undermine or neglect the cultural issues we already have to, to address, but it does need to be included when planning for a shared future together as a multicultural society. Perhaps a combined racial equality strategy and TPUC strategy into one wonderful peace plan should be considered, or at the very least, how better to connect these two strategies. When I think of young people, I often hear criticism about how they engage in activities connected with conflict, saying, sure, they weren't even born before the Good Friday Agreement, which is obviously true. But if you live in a single identity area, you're likely to pull back your curtains in the morning see a flag or a mural to remind you of what faction is in control in your area. You will know where it's safe to walk in your school uniform and you'll probably hear stories about the conflict from older fa family members and their friends. You may have lost a relative or had someone close to you injured as, as a result of the conflict. And young people will also hear politicians constantly refer to the past and often use it to justify victimhood or one-upmanship. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter if you've lived through the conflict, you still have to live with the fallout from it. This includes young people suffering from inequality in the most single identity areas. They suffer from things such as high levels of poverty and disadvantage, low educational attainment, drug and alcohol problems, paramilitary control, lack of choice in housing, high unemployment, dependency on benefits and negative aspirations for the future. And middle class young people may not experience as much disadvantage, but may decide to leave the region for university and or work away because of it they might never return again because of the conflict, because of the ongoing unresolved issues. The peace process should give young people the opportunity to become part of shaping an exciting new multicultural society that they could honestly boast about wherever they travel, as that international model of best practice that we often hear about. Most of all, it should give them hope for the future, free from sectarianism, segregation, division, racism and political negativity. Women, women were the backbone of peace building during the darkest times of the conflict and throughout it. They were often scorned, threatened, marginalised and verbally and physically attacked while participating in actions to overcome violence and build a peaceful society. Taking risks by going into each other's areas despite the danger was common. But they persisted and continue to collectively campaign on bread and butter issues and for peace. Nevertheless, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement led to an army of mainly male ex-combatants engaging in the peace process. They secured jobs and became spokesmen for the peace process, some in politics and some as community leaders in working class areas. Engaging ex-combatants and paramilitaries, it's normal in any part of a peace process and some, good, some were good at peace building, but it should have been better managed 
as it became more of a takeover rather than helpful and women generally became marginalised within the new arrangements. This flies in the face of the United Nations Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security to support women's participation in peace negotiations and in post-conflict reconstruction. The new peace plan I keep referring to must ensure women have a key role and should draw on numerous publications for insp inspiration. Then we have shared housing, and it's one of, it was one of the key issues for the civil rights campaign in the 60s and 70s. It's still an issue with 90% of housing predominantly single identity. In relation to interface barrier, barriers, according to research commissioned by the International Fund for Ireland, almost 100 plus interface barriers are still standing, even though some of them are 51 years old. The research affirms that what has been said for many years by interface communities, that interface barriers should come down in the right conditions. The right conditions include regeneration plans and an end to paramilitary control on either side of the barriers. It's also about raising expectations of what could be providing and providing the means to achieve it. The most difficult obstacle to overcome in interface areas is the expression and suppression of communities which tends to come from within. I've come across many examples of poor working class families that have had to stand and watch their children become lost to drugs and at the mercy of drug dealers who sometimes double up as community spokespeople. These representatives tell us that the people are afraid of the other side, that it is too soon for barriers to come down as it isn't safe enough. They fly the flags, paint the murals and build the bonfires, then seek payment to transform them or have them removed. They need to be told to stop putting them up, not paid for taking them down. Now is the time to challenge and change this recurring story. We must also be aware of areas where there are no physical barriers but suffer segregation in different ways. These are mainly in rural areas and small towns referred to as contested space. I interviewed a group of young people in single identity rural village and one of them described the area as an open prison, which was the opposite to the urban description like which was living in a goldfish bowl. Tony McCusker, a former CRC chair, talked about the establishment of a regeneration company for interfaces. I'm now inclined to agree with him. In conclusion, in relation to the drafting the next peace plan, we don't need to consult on the next steps. We have truckloads of comprehensive, good quality research and recommendations to draw upon. People often complain about consultation fatigue from being interviewed for this research. So let's give them a break and just revisit the best ones and put together the plan. And of course, we have the key focus on reconciliation. When I think of reconciliation, I visualise the restoration of relationships across the region, building on a foundation of equality, human rights, good relation and social justice. Our new reality is that we are now a region of minorities, which should frame the next phase of the peace building. It must be inclusive of all citizens, irrespective of their religious belief, political opinion, gender, race, disability, age, moral status or sexual orientation. Reconciliation is the beating heart of the peace process. Reconciliation and peace building shouldn't be a chore, nor should it be complicated. It should be euphoric and exciting as the signing of the Good Friday Agreement was. Northern Ireland needs to make up its mind about what it now expects from the peace process. We can either push peace building down under the weight of Brexit, Covid, recession and any other crisis you care to name, or we can develop a long-term roadmap for the direction of travel in respect of policy interventions to deliver a shared, reconciled and multicultural society. If we choose to move forward, then we need long-term intervention and political and civic commitment. The next phase of the, the peace plan will provide government with an opportunity to build on a strong foundation that we already have and push forward on addressing outstanding issues and how to tackle them. John Hume said, the real duty now, if we want to have a totally peaceful and stable country, is for all true Democrats to impl implement the will of the people. Bill Clinton said, finish the job. Thank you, Dimna. Um, lots to, to unpick there. Eileen, could I ask you to 
respond with your first thoughts on well, well, first Dentner. thoughts you know a lot of, of what Dentner ha has actually said is really true to my experience in working in the community and working at grassroots la level I, I don't believe that grassroots are listened to uh, you know yes there's people to listen to in community but it should be from the bottom up and you know I mean I spend more time explaining to the women what the policies mean uh, and have to waste time for me to try and understand it myself so I can deliver it to the women on the grassroots. So, you know, something that's easy to read and put into everyday language and not just for those people here who've got universities behind them that can able to read it. You know, that's one thing that I think, you know, that they, they did touch on there at the very beginning of all these policies and all these different policies. And, and, and the women that I work with, with across North and West Belfast, they're scratching their heads, not understanding what it means, which that creates confusion. That creates a lot of disbelief because if one community is better educated than the other community, then there's a suspicion that there's something behind it because they can't read it. So, uh, you know, I mean, if the language is the same for everybody, you know, we have a good Friday agreement. And then the women say to me, well, what, 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 what's this other agreement that we have? Now, did we not vote on the Good Friday Agreement? We weren't asked about the St Andrews Agreement, should we not have had a vote on that? You know, so uh, if political parties can't, don't agree, and you know, DUP never recognised the Good Friday Agreement, even though it was a democracy vote and 71% people voted for them, they went to St Andrews and changed it, you know, without the consent of the 71% who actually voted for it in the first place. And that causes a wee bit of, of unrest on, on one side or the other. Do you think Dimpna's idea of a, a peace plan is something that would incorporate all of those issues together, is something that would be, would be welcomed? I, I, I really do think that if there was one document, and this is where we're going to go forward with a peace plan, you know, you have to remember, you know, go way back before the Good Friday Agreement, before TBOC was even mentioned, the women's movement and the women's sector was doing all this work. We didn't have to wait on TBOC to start doing peace building. We didn't have to wait on the Good Friday Agreement to become friends with another community or another women's centre or another women's movement. We were already doing that work. And I firmly believe if the women's movement and the women's sector hadn't done what they'd done prior to the Good Friday Agreement, we wouldn't have a Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. Because women were in search of hope at that time. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that there's a document which the Good Friday Agreement had to be translated to, mm -hmm. by the way, mm -hmm. and it took a while to do that. But if there was a document that came out as like the Good Friday Agreement, explaining this is the way we're going to go, using the principles of the Good Friday Agreement that we've already agreed on. I can see a future in that. Mm. Hopefully, I can mm. see a future. I remember when the Good Friday Agreement and everybody was clapping and cheering and I was working in, in Shankle Women's Centre at the time and I thought I was being realistic and I says, look, it's going to take 15 years before we get anywhere, mm. really, because, you know, any type of, type of plan that you put in like that, with the 30 years of unrest that we had, it would take about 10 to 15 years. So I had planned to do peace building for 15 years. I'm still doing it 22 years later. You know, so something that's concrete mm. and that a younger generation mm. can actually move forward. Uh, a lot of people that's about now working in the, the peace building field are of an age that they want to retire and they're coming near retirement. And I think something should be built in for our youth mm. because we need youth to come in and do this work as well mm. and when we retire and when we move on that there's somebody that we can hand that role over to and to continue that work at the minute we don't have that mm. thanks Ellie. we'll come back to you in a, a little while duncan your initial thoughts on on dimness <laughs> well i agree with that i think there's too much in it it's really hard to sum it all up really and yeah. um, i suppose um I was thinking, you know, um, Northern Ireland is 100 years old uh, coming up next year and this has been kind of at the core of everything and it kind of pulls us all back so often and it's, it's kind of just there. And when people talk about Northern Ireland, they don't talk about the violence anymore, but they still talk about 
that that issue and even in COVID you can watch it happening and you know we can't make a decision because there's a, a veto from one side or the other about what COVID well how did that get mixed up and it kind of I suppose what I take from what Dimna said is until we actually take this seriously and it doesn't mean do it on its own it means connected to all those different things you know actually there's an element of doing something differently than we've always done before which has to be through like they're writing through a rock, like a stick of rock or something. Where, and I, at that point, I, I mean, come and I've had this conversation before, and I suppose I have been thinking, it was the lack of really understanding what peace meant for us that has been a really big issue, because it really does mean you have to look at it. You have to lift the rock and you have to see, is that working, and put it back. And I mean, I think they tried that with police, but it was probably the only one where the rock was really lifted right up. But everything basically our whole society after 30 years of you know violence and all it was built that that was built on and all the relations and discrimination and all the things that were there um you know there's this language in the university to talk about positive and negative peace and negative peace is that you don't have the violence so it's negative it's just like you're, you're something's gone away positive peace is this um you know that you build a, a society where actually conflict or wars is is not thinkable it's gone and you've moved to the stage where and that is harder work it's not as dramatic it doesn't uh, and I think we kind of stopped we we kind of thought right that's it done everybody signed up and you don't have to do anything else you can keep on everything else can kind of stay the same you can just keep on doing the same stuff mm. and actually um you can, but you get what we got, which is what them says. You know, stop, start, stop, start. You get the next crisis comes up, the next crisis comes up, the next crisis come up. And sure, it's better than it was 20, 30 years ago. But a lot of things are better than that. You know, there's, it's really hard. If that's your baseline, then basically just about anything's better than what was going on here uh, 30 years ago. So that doesn't give you anything. And it's, um, do, you feel, do you feel that we have abandoned peace building to those most affected by the conflict. In other words, yeah. uh, working class communities, victims and survivors, those who carry the burden, if you like, of uh, have we abandoned peace building to leave it to those people? I remember you talking before about middle class communities, those who are not affected by, by paramilitaries, those who aren't affected by poverty and those other issues. How do we make those people interested? Because this is, this is for everybody. So how do we make them interested? I remember in the 90s we did research and it was um, was basically who's doing community relations work mm. and this was prior to the agreement kind of in the 90s and it turned out it was uh, community development, youth work and women's organisations uh, so or children, visit schools as well. So it was, if you like, the, the weakest in terms of resources, the people who had the least resources, people in communities in the uh, young people and children and women's organisations and we were talking well what about business what about police what about housing what about education what about all these big things which have resources and can turn them around and uh, I think the negative piece says you go to the places where it's happening so you put all the all the evidence just on the people who are you know got the peace wall or got the riots or whatever else they have to do the work it's nothing to do with me or you say, actually, they're just the end of this chain. And I think it's interesting we're in this Black Lives Matter thing. And their whole issue is, you know, this is structural. This is, racism is not just something that happens to you when somebody, you know, doesn't give you a job or whatever it is. It happens to you because that's normal and lots of people back that up. And it's right up the system. And so if you're going to change it, you are going to have to, that's why another thing I think you're right is, you are going to have to look at big things, you know, schools, education the way we do that housing how are we going to make it possible for people just to get a house and live beside who you know where they have a house and to feel safe in that and that now applies to ethnic minorities how are you going to deal with uh, giving people room to have whatever cultural celebration they want without that being a threat to somebody else you know and you can push that right up to economics because actually the peace process has something to do with values it can't it it, it does say you know the victim's issue for me is um, these people's lives mattered. And once you say people's lives mattered, it means that you owe them something and you have to do something to change it. And I think uh, for me, th that has been the, 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 the next bit, which is what is our 
thinking about what, not what we've been from, but what it is we're trying to create, and how are we going to get there? Because, you know, it's it can't be just what was on the books before. We're going to have to innovate. I mean, a quarter of a century after the Good Friday Agreement, it is still uh, new, that an idea that we should be looking towards a system where people aren't educated as strangers. I mean, it's kind of mad, really. It's not a good. Uh, so I agree with you. Uh, the we need to involve everybody, and I think. You know, we we were quite good at innovation on um, constitutions in the Good Friday Agreement. They did quite a good job on that. They brought in the Human Rights Act. They brought in those values. They brought in uh, British and Irish or both. And they did all these kind of things. What we weren't very good at was our, the design of our political system to make sure that it wasn't shut down. Mm. It's not that, those, that the people who are in charge shouldn't be there. They need to be in the room. It's not about that. Mm. But there needs to be a dialogue. There needs to be some way. Mm. And I think one of the things you pointed out, or maybe it was you, was one of the worst things that's happened in our system, I think, is that the voluntary sector and the community sector and all these innovators have become frightened to speak out because there's a penalty. Yeah. Because you lose your funding. Mm. And if you, if you lose that element of the system, then there's nothing new comes into the system. People know that the incentive is to shut up and do what you're told. So I think that's been really bad for us. It's not a, you know, I mean, of course, there's a bit of give and take. There has to be a bit of a fight about these things. But I do think that's terrible is that people feel, you know, only the ones who get or special favours get the money. And I think that's been disastrous for us. Is we have to open up something again, which forces the merit principle, which forces people to say, and maybe it's independent bodies deciding once they set the principles who gets it. But you can't just hand out, you know, resources to people who are compliant and don't tell and do what they're told. You think this is too important an issue to be left to the politicians? I think it is. The politicians have to be working in a bigger picture. Mm. In other words, you can't lose the bigger picture. Of course, in any democratic society, the politicians have to be at the front of it. But I think my feeling was once the St Andrews Agreement happened and everybody came in, everybody was kind of, I think, kind of taken aback that this was possible. So it wasn't that people were necessarily negative about it. It was that. Um, it was kind of like announced then we've arrived and we don't need to do any more <laughs> or it's mm. all done by politicians now. Mm. And I think that that basically cut out so much information, so much innovation, so many people who had something to say. And of course, um, you know, and, and it also means then once it's got away, and I don't mean the politicians is too easy, but our political class aren't held to account anymore by what Dimna's talking about, which is how much progress have you made towards the purpose of this whole thing. You you know, you you haven't got power just to get power. You've got power to deliver the things you signed up to in the Good Friday Agreement in terms of purposes. So one of these things as you said was reconciliation. And I don't know how you hold politicians to account for that under our system. I don't know how I go to them and say, well how well are you doing? And uh, what can we do to make that happen? Because I don't think that T-Buck with its, I mean, at one level, really high level things like get the peace walls down, but no real plan to tell us how we're doing that and what has to happen to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And and actually, all of us know it's not going to happen. So <laughs> where are we going? Eileen, you talked about uh, a new generation of, of peace builders because people have been mm -hmm. around a long time. They're looking to retire. Maybe the same can be said for some of our politicians. They've been around a long time. They're maybe looking to retire. How do we build that new generation of peace builders, particularly if our young people, some of them have never experienced the conflict, never been involved in it. Um, some are now becoming involved in it and they're the age of the Good Friday Agreement or younger. So how do, we, how do we start to inspire and build that new generation? I mean, this has been something for the last four years I've been actually trying and I spoke to everybody about it. I spoke to funders about it, uh, not as a funder, but uh, uh, you get to know people and talk about them. And we need some type of good mentoring scheme. Uh, what I know and, and what skills I have uh, and my knowledge is in here. Mm -hmm. It's not in a book. It's not on files. And I would love some young person who has a passion for the future, a passion for 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 people to live and share together and I would love to have them for three years mm -hmm. so I could pass on all my contacts, all the people that I know, 
how I go about things. I'm not saying I go about things in the right way. People will tell you I don't go about things in the right way, <laughs> but I get things done mm -hmm. and I look outside the box. But that's all down to my training and what I have picked up over the years, you know, and doing, I, I'm doing, you know, well, most of my work in life because I was a trade unionist before I came into the community and I actually was a shop steward in Caffeina and Gallagher's when the Flags and Ambulance Act came out, when Fair Employment Act came out. I was involved in all that. So that was able to be transferred in the community. Now, I would love to pass on all that knowledge to somebody else, but I don't want somebody just threw you in under a scheme and give them mm -hmm. a few bob every week it needs to be waged mm -hmm. because what young person's going to come into the community when you're only guaranteed a year's funding at any given time where they want to start a family, maybe they want to buy a house and they can't because they're waiting on a year's funding, year's funding. I've been very, very lucky. I, you know, I've never been out of work. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I have worked in the same place. Mm -hmm. This is my fourth time back in the Shankill Women's Centre. Mm -hmm. But I have a passion for peace building, I have a passion for community relations, and I have a passion for that whole holistic approach to what I do. I want to pass that on, but I want somebody to be paid, like an apprentice, bring them in, pay them a decent wage, but give community workers who's working in peace and education within community too is very, very important, and health and well-being is very, very important too. Core fund us, core fund us that we're not scraping the bottom of the barrel and whatever's left in a, in a, in a budget that we may get. And we've been lucky, but we have also been very unlucky. We lost our whole education team in Shankill Women's Centre three years ago. We lost our young youth workers who, who, who worked with young women uh, across North and West Belfast. We lost that funding too. So, you know, these are jobs, well, you know I mean? You know I mean? The lottery will fund you, and we got seven years of the lottery. Fantastic program, loved us, but they don't do it anymore in seven years. Mm -hmm. So you're passed on to another funder. Mm -hmm. And just on the point of, 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 when you look at the peace walls, when you look at the peace walls that have been changed, it has been done by the community, mm -hmm. not by politicians. You just go up that Crumlin Road is an ideal. When you look in the left, the right hand side facing the chapel, they've took that wall away and they have put lovely fencing. Mm -hmm. They've done an alternative. There's still a barrier there, but it's not a barrier that you can't see other people from the other side of the road. So the because of COVID, there was fantastic work happening in Lower Road Park, and that wall was starting to be removed too but because of COVID that money has, has run out and it has been spent and it was taken back but fantastic work being done by community workers on the ground doing that work and they don't need this whole effort we need to get rid of walls. We have to work in the pace of the people who live there so it's them people that has to decide that and nobody else can decide where them walls stay or where them walls go only the people who live in each side of those walls. Mm -hmm. And that's who has to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So no matter I don't care who the politician is, it has to be the people within those communities, but it has to be the right community leadership mm -hmm. within those communities too, dictating where the walls stay up or the walls come down. And then the walls yeah. is really interesting, but I, and not but, I think it's really, would be a really interesting thing. There's another thing, just two things struck me about what I just said there. One is, we have to update the language and that has to happen naturally. So I think the peace issue, part of the problem I think for my generation is we are very aware that if you don't work on this, actually it hasn't gone away, you know, which means that actually we're sitting in a volcano. There is a generation who I think have had the benefit of the violence being away, but they lose the, the, the consciousness of the risk. And that's, that would be my concern, that it comes back at you at a rocket. Yeah. You know, it only takes one flag to go up in Belfast City Hall or to come down to Belfast City Hall and you're back into something. It only takes an Irish language act or somebody to pull 50,000 grants out of the uh, Gale Tax scheme, the Leave scheme, and you've got the, the Assembly down for three years. Uh, so these, in my mind, it's always like, this is still there. Yeah. Then the, the 
other thing that's really struck me working in the university is we focus, this almost goes to your point about we focus on the poorest communities. The issue has always been the peace walls and get why are those people still living by the peace walls and there's very little understanding of, of the actual risks people ran or of the life stories of people that gave them this and the, and the need also to, to give people more than just take a wall down but to build a better life. So again, you're still in that thing. But see, in the university, what it's really taught me, our new building in Ulster University is bang on the edge of the old city centre. The city centre is as marked by the conflict as any other, any area. Mm-hmm. And it was a big wall was put around it, a big fence. Nobody lived there. Uh, there's, there's, they know they need to get people back in. But if, and I'm going to say this in a, in a way, if the wrong people get back in, in other words, they're all one sort. There's a real fear that what that'll do is cut out, you know, the business for the community. That means who's getting the houses? It'll all have to be people who've got money. There again, people, imp- and so you can see how this all knocks on. And I kind of think. This is a big question. We have to, if we want a, a Belfast, for example, to get back to being a city where everybody uses it, it's more than just it's the building, the poor it's district. It's actually rethinking the city, which is why I think your thing of a peace plan at least goes to reaches up to the scale you're talking about. You're talking about a lot. <laughs> it has to be part of everything. Dumpna, you mentioned civic responsibility, um, people taking responsibility for building peace and reconciliation. How do we instill civic responsibility in people, particularly those who just have no interest, you know, and they say, oh, we've all moved on from then, you know, we don't want to go back there, you know, it's, a, it's not a nice place, we don't want to revisit it. Yeah, I mean, I find it interesting, I suppose I'm being a bit devilish, um, I think anything that the executive rejects is worth looking at. <laughs> so the cost of the vision, mm-hmm. I found interesting that was immediately thrown out. Mm-hmm. A shared future was immediately thrown out. Two very interesting and useful documents, probably the best two, well done. Mm-hmm. I think that people, I, I mentioned in the, the presentation I made, people don't have the information. You know, the vast majority of people walk about and if you stop them and say, tell us what you think of Teabuck, they wouldn't have a baldy notion. <laughs> and I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it mean to them? It's targeted towards here. You know, it, it, first of all, we need um, a, a language, an exciting language that gives direction, that says this is an opportunity. It's not something that you're labouring and, you know, it's, it's a drag and we're having to look at the past. It's exciting and it's helpful and it's caring because the past is important too. But that there's an opportunity to reshape society. And uh, I mentioned that there are huge opportunity that we're missing big time, but have the opportunity if we're gonna go to the next phase is the multicultural society. Mm. We have an opportunity to be like any other major region throughout Europe and become normalized with lots of different cultures that, and sell the, the benefits of that. You know, it's not a scary thing, it's great. And it's part of the peace process we're reshaping society and that's a big element of it. I think civil society, if they're given the proper information um, and they're given the right language and it's exciting and it's an opportunity and it's, it's going to make things better, mm-hmm. I think they will naturally become engaged. Mm-hmm. And if it needs to be mainstreamed throughout all government departments. It isn't part of any one given. It's throughout them all and throughout the um, uh, councils. Mm-hmm. It needs to be mainstreamed. So it should be part of everyday language and part of building in how we get society back on track. Mm. If we don't do that, everything else is, is a, a crisis or a priority and we limp along. And I agree with Duncan you, and, and Eileen that you are at risk at any second of reverting back because we're structured that way. We are still in silos in our mind and on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to engage civil society, but we need to give them something tangible. And the two things for me are, a good business case of why we should move ahead and an exciting prospect. And secondly, they also need to be aware of what happens if you don't, mm. because it gets worse. If, yeah. if you're in poverty, you'll get poorer. And who, who would you envisage as leading this? Do you see this as a partnership between um, you know, grassroots community organisations and government? Do you see it as creating a space for, for having those conversations to, cre- to come up with a plan? Um, 
Don't raise the point, how do you get through to the politicians? Mm -hmm. And I have suggested that we need to bring together people who are independent of government, independent of uh, politics, independent of uh, an employer that, that have to abide by the, um, their contract, independent of religious aspect, who can come together uh, and, and people who also uh, are well respected in the field. We have a lot of brilliant people uh, here existing now that could fill that role, come together to assess what's happening and do an annual report, work throughout the year, keep an eye on things that we've identified need to be yeah. and can stand up without fear of someone coming by and saying, you're sacked or this isn't what our church believes in or politically whatever. Um, that they can stand up and say that isn't good enough and we need to move forward or that's been very good, let's build on it, but can honestly give a, a, a clear, honest assessment of how far we've gone, what the obstacles are, what needs to be done next, what's good, mm. what's worth pursuing. But uh, that's how we get politicians. Mm. We have to shame them nearly or lead them. Mm. There's a lot of politicians there that haven't got a voice as well who are the silent majority, the two main parties, the way it's structured, uh, do the talking for them. Um, so something initially independent of, of politicians just to get the It has to be home. really independent of politicians mm -hmm. and also have credibility that people on the ground will listen to them so that when they speak as a united voice on all the different aspects that we talked about, they'll be listened to. Mm -hmm. And they can come up with creative ideas if there's a gap in um, a vision for a way forward mm -hmm. in each of the areas mm -hmm. but I think we definitely need that mm -hmm. and they can look at also the resources and funding on the ground and the, the groups and how you engage with civils that maybe they could help uh, civil society get the voice because mm -hmm. there is the problem that won't go away very easily of dependency on government funding mm -hmm. um, and you, you may be punished if you do speak out or say something contrary to what government have said um, so they could give voice to that as well, but I think that's the first necessary step and from that you would get maybe the second phase peace plan idea mm. rolling as they start to investigate the different issues. Eileen, how do we give recognition to those who are working so hard on the ground at the minute to preserve the peace? How do we go about celebrating their work? I think you, you go about it. Uh, recognition. Nobody has ever, I don't believe, has recognised openly what the women's sector, women's centres at the time. Shankill's 33 years, so that's 11 years before the Good Friday Agreement. I believe Falls is 37 years going. So, you know, the groups that actually went through the worst of the worst are the ones that should be looked after because they're still doing what they've done and what they have done they have grew old there <laughs> grew older with the process so the knowledge that's within the, the, the that sector and within the movement is months it's really months and you know i mean you said there earlier about you know how do we get middle class business people involved in this i think if they're around the table with us and they're hearing what our problems are and what our issues are and the, the, the struggles that we're having, maybe they will have a better understanding, you know, of what's actually going on. So it's, it's not, I think, right to say that they, they, they're not interested. If they don't know what's going on, they're not, they're not going to be interested. So if we're going to communicate, we have to communicate across all the sectors. People who are living in wealthier, places need to know what's happening in the areas that's not so wealthy mm. uh, and the people who actually went through the worst of, of, of the conflict. So recognition is, I think I remember one time Billy Hutchison said it and, I, and I'll quote it, he says, we don't want a hand out, we want the hand up. And it's about those areas, mm -hmm. if the investment was put into those areas, and work with those people, you know, in their, those areas. We have generations that are growing up, and Dimpton had said it in her, a bit of work that you said, that their younger ones who weren't even born in the Good Friday Agreement mm -hmm. are growing up sectarian. They're growing up, so they're going to become adults mm -hmm. someday. So that adult education still needs to happen within, within the, the community. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, we have three and four generations of people co has come through our centres, but that's because of the signal that the community that they're living in, and they hear what they're hearing in their communities. You know, there's, there's a lot. I done a survey one time in Rathcool a number, a number of years ago, and we were doing a, a programme with Community Dialogue, and one of the questions was, what's the difference now, you know, 20 years on, than what it was back then, you know, before the Good Friday Agreement. And every one of them turned around and says, we fear, we fear our own community more now than we fear the other. So, you know, there's an, an internal yes. issue, and it's not about the other side, mm. always. So, and that's created within those single identity communities. So we need to recognise that too. So peace building doesn't have to be between Protestant and Catholic. Mm -hmm. Peace building actually happens within communities mm -hmm. as well as outside mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so we, we need to look at peace building in a different way. Mm -hmm. Peace building also includes community planning. Mm -hmm. You know, with Belfast City Council's come out with their community planning. They need to be thinking, right, who do we need to talk to here? Instead of sending somebody out and getting loads of money, thousands of pounds, of coming up with an idea, and they maybe don't even live there, mm. and they don't know the issues that's on the ground. So, you know, I think we need to all be round the table, as Dempna says, mm. that from, from, from the grassroots up, not from the top down, it has to be from the grass. The worst effect that there should be more of them round the table, and the least the fact that there should be less of them around the table. But they should have a seat at that table. Mm -hmm. It's not about not letting them at the table. And we also should have our Indian community, our Jewish community, and the Chinese community that we're working with. So, you know, I work with women across communities. Mm -hmm. I don't work on a cross-community basis. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the difference. Mm -hmm. It's women all wanting the same thing from across all the communities that we have living in our community. I remember Brian Barrington, who was a SDLP advisor, I think he might have been even John, it may have not been John, but Seamus' advisor. And he said to me, actually, if politicians need to understand that this is something that is hard to deliver for a politician because you're under your own pressures, but we need somebody to hold us to account from somewhere on this one. And he said, you know, we need a licensed ir irritant, he talked about, you know, somebody who you allow to be annoying. In other words, they keep bringing it back. And I've never had a better formulation of that. That is, it is annoying to be constantly told you're not you know, doing good enough on all of these things. But actually, if you're not told, then you drift off as if it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think there's something in there, which is how do we, uh, in a way, it's not about not being for politicians, how do we get politicians to be their better selves, which we had a little window of that somewhere around the peace process where people said, you know something, for us, to, any of us to get any further, you know, for you to go somewhere, I have to go somewhere, and I have to go somewhere, you have to go somewhere. So we, we kind of got it, and we've got this deal, and we have to somehow keep it because it gets lost very quickly, I think, and there's, that's my question, is how do you keep that in the front? And that was probably epitomised by seeing John Hume and David Tribble yeah. on the, the stage with, with Bono. Bono. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think we could go on and, and talk all night about this, but unfortunately we've, we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank my guests, Eileen Weir, Professor Duncan Morrow and Dimpna McGlade. My thanks all to, also to Alan Meebin and to Tim Atwood, Secretary of the, the John and Pat Hume Foundation. Thanks for watching.